Hi, so I'm Lauren and this is Sally and we're both researchers in, um, the, in our Department of Education. We're both professors of education at Belmont University in Nashville. And if you're not familiar with Belmont, it's a private, small private liberal, growing private liberal arts college, university in um, Nashville, Tennessee. So <clears throat> I'm going to share with you a little bit today about a project that we started about five years ago and we're working where we started working with three dis three area districts in Middle Tennessee, right outside, right outside of Nashville, including Nashville's main um, Metro Nashville Public School District. And we started, this was about five years ago, when, um, how many of you are, are, how many of us are education professors? So it's just us. Okay. <laughs> just making sure I didn't know my audience. Um, so about five years ago, or even if you've got kids or you're familiar with public school education, when they rolled out the Common Core, um, it was very controversial. What was particularly controversial was that our language arts teachers were going to be asked to be teaching informational texts in addition to their traditional Macbeth to Kill a Mockingbird sorts of units. And as a teacher educator, trying to integrate that informational text kind of meant prying those Macbeth units out of their hands, which was really, really tough. When we dove into what those informational texts were that um, the guides kind of let us say, you know, said we should be diving into. They were things like um, water tables and things that were very sciencey and very informationy, which your typical freshman and sophomore language arts teacher really had no acquaintance with, and were really nervous about diving into those. So the goal for our project initially was to really help our English language arts teachers integrate this informational text, but we knew they couldn't do it themselves. So we wanted to ask them to bring their science teachers alongside with them and begin to integrate text into what they're teaching. Because your typical science teacher wasn't teaching text. They were doing labs and math and that sort of stuff. So our big goal was to bring these two groups of teachers together to help them generate some interdisciplinary lesson plans that might connect in some ways, that might overlap, and to introduce them to some different models for integrating their teaching. A big piece of this was going to be facilitating this interdisciplinary collaboration. We targeted middle and high schools, and if you even remember back on your middle and high school days, in the elementary, in the primary grades, all of our, our third grade teachers worked together. When you hit the subject areas, the history teachers stay together, English teachers stay together. Everything is very siloed. So our goal was to bring in teams of seventh grade, ninth grade, tenth grade teachers and get them talking. So um, the very the first year that we did our project, we actually we, we decided we needed a really interesting hook. And so our hook was gardening, cooking and gardening. And so we brought together 23 middle and high school teachers using this inter integrated curriculum model. And what we did as faculty from, Sally and I are both in the um, education department, but within our team of seven faculty members, we had a professor of math, um, a professor in chemistry, a professor in biology, an English an English professor. Did I fit, forget someone? Matt, you said math. And I said math. So we tried, we hit some key areas. We didn't have a history professor just because of availability purposes. But um, so what we did is we started off by designing some model lessons for them. So one example of our model lesson, um, this is, these are actually two of our teachers, and they have just completed a model lesson on pollinators where our biology professor used an informational text, an article that was, um, you know, really biology oriented. And then at the same time, our, our English professor used um, Animal, Vegetable, Mineral by Barbara Kingsolver as a text and a unit that you could dive into, and they did those in one way. Um, another model lesson we did involved cooking, and um, that was using, our English professor used the omnivore's dilemma, and then they, um, we did a lesson where they made pancakes, and they, and I'm not a chemistry person, but <laughs> I learned a lot, a lot more than my chemistry teacher taught me. Um, so we used those to kind of get them excited and for them to help see, okay, this, this is how you do this. So they had a vision for them. Um, and then our goal for them was to create these interdisciplinary lessons for them to go back and implement in their schools. Now the biggest challenge for us though is how do you find that time? How do you create the, that time for those professors? They were so excited during that summer, but 
how do you find that time? So we thought one important component of our summer workshop are using critical friends groups. And Sally is a trained facilitator, facilitator yeah. for um, critical friends, and she's going to tell you a little bit about that piece of our workshop. And so the exciting piece of this, so since we've got people here from different disciplines and different ways of life and working, um, this process that we're going to talk about can apply across a wide range of disciplines. So even though we use it for the purpose of teacher preparation, these processes that we use face-to-face -face and then eventually in our you know, landed learning environment can be used across a variety of disciplines. But because one of our goals was to facilitate interdisciplinary collaboration, we thought it was important to build into our session of, um, intentional ways for our educators to come together and work together in designing these lesson plans. And so we, as, as educators in K-12 and as also um, in higher ed, we have participated in professional learning communities. And this is what we wanted to, to build for our students, these learning communities where they can come together and work together. And then from our own research and also from our own experiences across the years, we knew there were some pitfalls and barriers to these teachers coming together and working. And some of the barriers that we knew about and we wanted to work to prevent, um, first of all, time. You know, finding time to get together and making it productive time. I don't know how many of you have been in meetings where you've left and said that was a big waste of time. <laughs> you know, we could have been doing something else. And so we really wanted these meetings to be intentional and worthwhile for our, for our teachers. Um, and also another barrier was in-depth conversations. Many times when teachers come together, they kind of stay at the surface level. And another barrier as well, um, I'm sure you've been in these meetings where you have people who just monopolize that conversation. So that you have kind of a know-it-alls and talk, 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 and other members don't get a chance to participate. And then finally, the, the feeling for the teachers of really being willing to be vulnerable to share their practice and for others to critique their practice. And so we were really intentional in thinking about these barriers and how could we bring our teachers together to prevent those barriers. So we incorporated a framework within Critical Friends Groups. And has anybody heard of Critical Friends Groups? Oh, awesome, all right. So when we first used, we've been using this for many years, but when we first started using this, that term critical was like, kind of, you know, like, like critical, what do you mean critical? And so the idea of Critical Friends Groups is that our teachers, um, they're, they're, they're trusting colleagues in terms of, you know, they're, they're not critical in the sense of being mean, but they're trusting colleagues that come together, that have share that same vision of improving their practice and improving student outcomes, um, as well as also being committed to being reflective and being honest with their colleagues and providing that intentional feedback. So that was a real important part of that. And so these critical friends groups, from our experience and our research into them, really help to prevent some of those barriers. And we'll show you what a protocol looks like in just a minute, but just an overview of, of what makes these groups unique and they're really appealing to us. Um, as the groups are about six to 12 members, within our um, work, we had about eight teachers in a group. And what we did was we brought together our interdisciplinary teams from multiple schools. So it wasn't just one school. It was a couple of two or three schools coming together to really look at these, these interdisciplinary lessons that they were developing. And what we love about our critical friends groups is it brings a structure that on the surface may seem like too much structure, but this is one of the things our teachers say was some of the best professional development they received, and we wanted to give them a process that they, they could use in their schools when they returned. And so there's norms and protocols that are part of these critical friends groups. And the norms are really the guidelines for participation. So in any kind of professional meeting, we think it's important to have what does participation look like and sound like, and what are those guidelines that we all agree to. And we know we had a lot of bright teachers who like to talk, so one of our norms was share the air. And we were intentional in talking to our participants about how important it is to, st to speak and step up and then step back and really give other people that space to be able to talk and participate. Um, and so you usually come up with two to three norms that you agree upon and that you, that you use throughout the process. And then the protocols, there, um, we, we brought our protocols from the National School Reform Faculty and the website is there. Protocols are really the steps and processes for that group's work. So that's why I said it could apply to a variety of disciplines. It really is the steps for how you're going to achieve the goal that you want to achieve during that meeting. And so our protocols that we use, and I'll show you one in just a minute, is a tuning protocol. And so this is what a protocol looked like. So when we taught our participants this model, 
of uh, critical friends group, we met for about 20 to 30 minutes. And it was a very time efficient process. And so they all had an agenda that looked like this. We have so many minutes for this. We have so many minutes for this. And the protocols can be used for a variety of, of situations. This one was for fine tuning these lesson plans. So our participants would develop the lessons and then come together with a question. So I might have a question. For example, how can I use my assessment more effectively and efficiently to evaluate my learning outcomes? But critical friends can be used for a problem within your organization. How do we resolve this? I mean, it can be used for a lot of different things. And they typically have someone who leads it. But then this one, we have somebody who presents or shares a problem that they are challenged with their lesson. And then we have the participants who participate in that discussion. So what we really, really liked about this, um, these protocols, if you see um, the, kind of the fourth one down, individual writing, it's not just about speaking and the first thing that comes to the top of your tongue or your brain, but it really allows us to have a space and time for quiet reflection and to really think about and be intentional and think about what it is that we want to talk about during this meeting. So it's some talking, some listening, uh, but it's very clear in the structures in terms of when is it your turn to speak and when is it your turn to listen and when is it everyone's turn to, turn to write and to reflect. So we found this to be a very um, effective way to structure that professional learning community, but we had a challenge with it. Oh, yeah, before our challenge, so here are some of the benefits <laughs> of, of the um, Critical Friends Group. And one of the things that we really liked about this, in terms of our K-12 teachers, and I also want to say as a faculty, as an interdisciplinary faculty, we also use this process to improve our teaching at the university. And some of these benefits also aligned with what our participants said were effective. But the naive questions, so our participants were a little nervous, like, I'm not a science teacher. How can I help a science teacher tune one of her or his lessons? And so the idea is that we're not really giving them specific solutions, but we're asking questions. Like, I wonder if, I wonder if you thought about, I wonder how this would, would be look like in your lesson. So a lot of times it's just kind of wonderings and, and wondering what the impact would be. And then it's up to that, that, that person who we're speaking to, to to take that or leave that. So it really is those naive questions provided a lot of, of great insight. Um, into what that work is. But here's our problem. So, like I said, when we finished our summer workshop with our um, group of teachers, our, and we've, we've done this for, we had three different summers that we've done this. At the end of each summer, they were all really excited, and they would go back to school so pumped up, and then we always had, we're big believers in not doing the kind of big nuclear bomb of professional development and walk away. So we wanted to kind of continue that through the fall, and that was really a big challenge for us, because what we found was that as soon as we would, as part of their summer workshop, they would create um, different lesson plans and we shared them through Dropbox. We had a shared website at one point. We did all this work during the summer. And then when fall hit, it was crickets. And they're, 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 some of the schools were really far away. So some of us would try, we started back to teaching. It was hard for us to get away from campus long enough to do some visits. We did some visits our second year, but we just felt like we weren't terribly successful. We did a dinner um, that was kind of like a midpoint where we wanted faculty to come. Our first year, we had about 10 of our 20, 10 of, maybe close to 10 of our faculty teachers come join us. The second year, we had one teacher show up. We had so much leftover Mexican, we didn't know what to do with it. <laughs> and so that really prompted us, and we're like, we've got to figure out how to keep them engaged, and we've got to be smart about this. Um, and the feedback, they particularly, all of our kind of post-test questions was, we need, the, we need you guys as we go back into the school year. And they were struggling with their critical friends groups where you know it seems like, oh, we've got it, we've got it. But they wanted a Belmont faculty member to participate as a facilitator and help them along. So our solution was that we decided that this past year, now instead of cooking and gardening, our topic was actually storytelling. So it was storytelling across the discipline. So we had some history teachers in, some science teachers, so we had a true, a true interdisciplinary teams. Um, and then we added where, as part of our grant materials, each of our teachers got a Google Chromebook. And we built in, we would have regular, you can, we would have regular touch points with our Google Hangouts. We said, we're gonna start small. Um, what we did is, of our seven Belmont faculty, we assigned one, at least one faculty coach to each school group. And so we had four or five 
We had five different school groups. So one of our groups had two faculty. But after our first part, we did a half day of online se se a half day that was an online session because we wanted to capture that excitement and convince them that yes, you can do this online. We had a lot of a lot of variety of um, a lot of differences in kind of expertise with technology. So some faculty, some of our teachers were really excited, some were really nervous. That was supposed to kind of help them ease into that. Um, so we had a calendar of meetings with Critical Friends groups and um, set up our Google Hangout meetings. And so that was our plan to um, move forward. And then we, we ran into some barriers, um, technology issues. There were, some, there were some faculty, some of our teachers who like never could quite get the Google Hangout to work or never could get their computer online or you know all sorts of things that would come up and that were difficult. Most of them we felt like were user er errors um, anecdotally, we did have one faculty member come back with, well, you know, when we did our critical friends groups, it was just kind of flat. It was really quiet. There wasn't a lot of reflection of it. It just wasn't as productive. It was a really introverted group. Um, we also had logistical issues with our calendar. We had originally planned, all of the school districts had planned on having the day of the eclipse, because the eclipse came right through Nashville. They were going to, all of the schools were closing. And so we planned for that to be that morning was going to be our like one, one and a half hour day. And then the school districts all said, wait a second, let's teach with the eclipse. And so all the schools were back in. And so it kind of threw a wrench in our overall plan. But um, overall, we did feel like it was a success. Anecdotally, our teachers responded positively. They really liked the online environment. Um, like most of you know, if you've been on, in an online environment, a lot of people who are quiet in person, when they're online, it's a different story. So. Um, on the Google Hangouts, we had that. We did see a lot more lessons generated all through the semester because of those touch points. We still had, we were having lessons being dropped in. And when we had our winter dinner, where it's the last winter dinner, we only had one attendee, we had perfect attendance except for two teachers who had to be at basketball games because of a snow day the week before. And we really think they wanted to come. Um, so we felt like we had much better engagement. We've got plans with our teachers to continue with other grant proposals. They're participating in writing articles with us. So it's really created this long, this really way of connecting and staying connected. Um, yeah, and I also want to say as, as we kind of, um, uh, kind of what we've learned too, that because of the structure of critical friends groups, it really does lend itself to this virtual kind of meeting space. Because once people understand the steps and the structure, when, once they get online the virtually, they're able to walk through those processes and they really understand the importance of that. So, so kind of part of what we learned is that we were able to, to really facilitate that understanding face-to-face, -face, which helped them when we went to the virtual um, place as well. And what we learned, so we felt like we were successful, but of course you're always learning and always trying to improve. And I think we spent so much time thinking about the teachers that we didn't think about our own competencies. So we've decided that um, next time around we would do some more explicit training with our Belmont faculty members. We made some assumptions on what our own faculty members um, knew about utilizing technology and to more clearly outline um, for each of our faculty members what the expectations were and to intentionally pair the mentors in different ways. I'm pretty like dive in with all the technology and I'll mess up and I don't care and I'll keep going. And I was actually paired with a school that was very tech heavy, whereas one of our partners um, who's our biology professor is a little more introverted, a little more, a lot more timid with technology. And we paired her with a school in Dixon County where we figured out, oh wait, these, they're, they're really nervous about technology. So they had lots of issues and they didn't have some kind of crazy abandoned fool like me who would be like, oh, well, let's just do this. Let's, you know, problem solve different ways. Um, so we always like to acknowledge um, our, all of our work's been funded by the Tennessee Higher Education Commission. Um, our University of Belmont also pitches in enormously and does a lot of match, matching with our grant and funding a lot of things like us coming here and a lot of extra work and things for our teachers. Um, so our, both of our colleges and our teacher participants in our summer workshop have been fantastic and really helped us all learn. So this is us. You will find our PowerPoint uploaded um, as soon as we figure out how to do that. We haven't done it, <laughs> haven't done it yet, but we're going to. Um, 